this week's prophecy update I've titled Convergence. Uh, we see a lot of things happening in the world. One of the things that we talk about a lot here is that uh, all of these different lines of Bible prophecy are converging at the same time. Um, everything is happening at the same time. The economy, weather, Israel, the Middle East, the geopolitical situation in the world, morality, culture, and that type of thing. This week we're going to talk about a few things like apostasy, culture, and the Middle East. So the first thing we're going to talk about this week uh, is apostasy. And that is false teaching in the church. It is what Jesus warned about more than any other sign of the end time. We're into conference season, so what we have is we have a lot of the apostates in the church. We have them collecting together, uh, and it, it, I appreciate that they do this. I don't, I'm concerned that people go to them, but I, I'm glad that they get together so we can all identify them, and they're all in one place. So here's one that's going on this weekend, Jerusalem 2015, uh, sponsored by the head of this uh, Empowered 21 Global Con Conference. Uh, Congress. It's a lot of people from the New Apostolic Reformation, people from like IHOP in Kansas City, from Bethel uh, Church in Redding, California. That's Bill Johnson's church, which, by the way, it, the more I research that church in Bethel, uh, Redding, California, this is rank New Age mysticism that's being layered onto Christianity. In fact, Bill Johnson in a book years ago said, Hey, why shouldn't we use this stuff, too, in the church? New Age stuff. It's there. It must come from God. It must be good. So let's use it. And they have, if you see, I've talked about it. Now, some of you, I, you know, there are people watching, and they don't hear every week. So Bethel Church goes out, and they do a thing. I kid you not, they call it. This is what they call it. They go out and lay on the graves of dead Christian ministers, and they call it grave sucking. They get the spirit from the bones of the dead person. Now, Scripture calls it necromancy, but I have pictures I can show you up here in Oberlin, Ohio, in the cemetery by Oberlin, near Oberlin College, laying on the grave of Charles Finney, who was a rank apostate. Now, a lot of people in evangelicalism like him, but study what Finney believed. Finney was incredibly dangerous. He didn't believe in original sin, and his influence on evangelicalism is still felt to this day. He supposedly loved a, rival called the, uh, a revival called the Second Great Awakening. It went through upstate New York, mainly in the Finger Lakes region and that area up towards Syracuse and Rochester, and they called it the Burned Over District because the because the district had been so burned over from the revival fires of that time. But what was the result? It was where some of the worst cults that we still deal with today had their uh, greatest growth, or, their, or like Mormonism, it, their origin. That came out of the time of the Second Great Awakening. I don't think there's a mistake that there's a reason why that happened. Because it was the false teaching of guys like Finney who did that yet so Bethel goes to the te the grave of a false teacher to absorb his spirit and energy from his bones and people are following falling for this all over when I spoke in Sacramento last fall they told me of a, a new church that had started less than two months before uh, two services on Sunday night uh, down at Folsom, California, not too far from the church I attended on Sunday morning, uh, started by Bethel uh, in Jesus Culture, their music group, and they were running 4,000 young people on Sunday nights in two services after two months. So don't think that this, this thing is not having tremendous influence. Well, some of the speakers at this uh, conference, there was uh, Jack Hayford was there, um, George Wood, the head of um, the Assemblies of God, uh, Cindy Jacobs, she's this um, crazy prophetess lady, um, Mark Green, the head of, um, isn't he the founder of Hobby Lobby, I think, 
he's uh, very much into this new apostolic reformation thing and not very big supporter of Israel too, by the way, you just should know that. Um, the president, I think the president of Oral Roberts was the, the, the head of this, the chairman of this. Uh, and so there were all these different people who were, uh, Stephen Strang from uh, Charisma Media was there. Uh, Ron Lutz of um, Teen Mania Ministries. Just, it was a whole group of people that believe that we're gonna just turn around the culture and change everything. Another conference that's coming up here in a couple weeks in Chicago, I think next weekend in Chicago, uh, the 5th and 6th, is the Justice Conference. And that'll have speakers like Len Hybels, from uh, the pastor, the wife of the pastor, of, well, co-founder of Willow Creek Community Church, is how she described, an advocate for global engagement, uh, Eugene Cho, uh, pastor, writer, and visionary. Dr. Cornell West, a rank radical Marxist from Harvard. Uh, Lou Giglio, of course, and Voss Camp, uh, one of Pastor Steve's favorite reads, I think. And uh, I'm just joking. Don't read that junk. Uh, Jonathan Merritt, who's a Southern Baptist and writes. He's, he claims to be middle of the road, but he's a leftist. So um, there's another one that somebody sent me an email about this morning. I didn't even have time to uh, put anything together with. And these conferences are just, they're all over the place, and you need to be careful about who's speaking there. Look into their backgrounds before you go and expose yourself to this junk. And if you're not well-grounded, stay away. Don't pay attention. Um, some of us will uh, look at what's taught there and tell you uh, what's wrong. Remember, it was just a year ago, the Catalyst had a conference down in Dallas, and in that conference, they had Philena Huritz, a lady who identifies herself as a Catholic, teaching centering prayer and mysticism. Andy Stanley's conference, Catalyst. They also gave a free packet like a two-pack or three-pack for an Enneagram Institute self-evaluation. And, and you go to the Enneagram website and they identify themselves as the best conglomeration of all sorts of traditions, New Age, Buddhism, Hinduism, and whatever. And this is being given to the pastors at a Catalyst conference. And other than a few crazy people, <laughs> like maybe myself and Jim Fletcher and a few others, have you heard anybody say anything about it? And yet all these people promote Catalyst conferences, and they're being taught rank apostasy there. Got to avoid it. Well, we also have what I call the view of the secular apocalypse, and that was demonstrated this week um, best by President Obama's address at the Coast Guard Academy. Now, I'm going to play, you know, Obama warning, but I'm going to play some clips of this, and I want you to see if you can pick out um, what I would call the head-banging moments on your own, okay? So here he is talking to the Coast Guard Academy, and he's going to start off, he's going to say, we live in a world of terrorism, okay? But the biggest thing we're going to face is not terrorism something else so listen we need you to safeguard our ports against all threats including terrorism and this brings me to the challenge I want to focus on today one where our Coast Guardsmen are already on the front lines and that perhaps more than any other will shape your entire careers and that's the urgent need to combat and adapt to climate change as a nation, we face many challenges, including the great... Now, I could probably identify victims of terror. I have yet to meet a victim of terror, that a victim of climate change, that equates to a beheaded victim of terror, something like that. A threat of terrorism. And as Americans, we will always do everything in our power to protect our country. Yet even as we meet threats like terrorism, we cannot and we must not ignore a peril that can affect generations. 
I know there are still some folks back in Washington who refuse to admit that climate change is real. There are folks who will equivocate. They'll say, you know, I'm not a scientist. Well, I'm not either. But the best scientists in the world know that climate change is happening. It's called the appeal to authority. Everybody knows this is true. Our analysts in the intelligence community know climate change is happening. Our military leaders, generals and admirals, active duty and retired, know it's happening. And if they don't, bye-bye. Our homeland security professionals know it is happening. And the science is indisputable. The fossil fuels we burn release carbon dioxide, which traps heat. And the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere... Water vapor acts the same way, and none of that comes from burning fossil fuels. ...are now higher than... The science is indisputable. ...than they have been in 800,000 years. The planet is getting warmer. Fourteen... By the way on balance. Is that really a bad thing? I mean, we lose Florida, okay, but, you know, <laughs> it's kind of hot and humid down there anyway, so uh, people in Georgia want beachfront property, you know, so. But, I mean, really, more people die from cold than heat on a year-to-year -year basis. This, see, the reason why I'm playing this is not to torture you. I know it sound, it's like waterboarding, I know, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, like waterboarding, if you count to, like, 50, you know it'll be over, okay? So count to 100, you know, and hold your breath and whatever. But the reason I do this is when we talk about a coming apocalypse, everybody's running around saying, oh, you're nuts, you're crazy, you're intolerant, you're, you're, you're out of your minds. But what I'm trying to show you is that leftism, which, which guides our president, and we'll see some other leaders in the world today, is as much a religion as what we follow in Christianity. And, and so they're, they're following a religion. So they, that's why, you know, they believe in an apocalypse too. So let's get it right. We agree that there's an apocalypse coming. I think it's coming because it's God's plan. They think it's man's in charge of the 15 hottest years on record have been in the past 15 years. Last year was the planet's warmest year ever recorded. Our scientists at NASA just reported that some of the sea ice around Antarctica is breaking up even faster than expected. There's also more the ice glaciers there. glaciers are melting, pouring new water into the ocean. Over the past century, the world sea level rose by about eight inches. That was in the last century. By the end of this century, it's predicted to rise another one to four feet. Climate change will impact every country on the planet. No nation is immune. So I'm here today to say that climate change constitutes a serious threat to global security, an immediate risk to our national security. Now, if someone like him is in charge, we know there's a world leader coming. All the things that come upon the earth, the judgments of God that are laid out in Revelation, famine, pestilence, all this stuff are going to be explained away as being caused by man. Okay? It, it, it's all set up. The devil's very clever, and he has agents that are doing his work already. And make no mistake, it will impact how our military defends our country. And so we need to act, and we need to act now. After all, isn't that the true hallmark of leadership? When you're on deck, standing your watch, you stay vigilant. You plan for every contingency. And if you see storm clouds gathering, or dangerous shoals ahead, you don't sit back and do nothing. You take action to protect your ship, to keep your crew safe. Anything less is negligence. 
It is a dereliction of duty. Do you see where this is set up? Negligence and a dereliction of duty. If you are in the military, in leadership, and you deny climate change as taught by the great leader, you are subject to court-martial. That's what's coming. It's a dereliction of duty. Do you agree with me? Okay, there's a man who's been in the military, and he says he's been waiting for it. He's back there nodding his head. So it's coming. And so, too, with climate change. Denying it or refusing to deal with it endangers our national security. It undermines the readiness of our forces. We are, by nature, optimists, but we're not blind optimists. We know that wishful thinking in the face of all evidence to the contrary would set us on a course for disaster. If we are to meet this threat of climate change, we must be realists. We have Around the world, climate change increases the risk of instability and conflict. Elsewhere, more intense droughts will exacerbate shortages of water and food, increase competition for resources, and create the potential for mass migrations and new tensions, all of which is why the Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier. Understand climate change did not cause the conflicts we see around the world. Yet what we also know is that severe drought helped to create the instability in Nigeria that was exploited by the terrorist group. So it didn't cause it, but now I'm going to give you an examples of how it did cause it. Does he read this stuff before he... ...group Boko Haram. It's now believed that drought and crop failures and high food prices helped fuel the early unrest in Syria, which descended into civil war in the heart of the Middle East. Around the world, climate change will mean more extreme storms. Yeah, and he said in his speech, now, well, maybe he says it here. I mean, no single weather event can be blamed solely on climate change, but typhoon. But I'm now going to give you some examples of ones that I think are. It's just typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines gave us a possible glimpse of things to come. One of the worst cyclones ever recorded. Thousands killed. Many more displaced, billions of dollars in damage, and a massive international relief effort that included the United States military and its Coast Guard. Climate change, and especially rising seas, is a threat to our homeland security, our economic structure, uh, infrastructure, the safety and health of the American people. In New York Harbor, the sea level is already a foot higher than a century ago, which is one of the reasons Superstorm Sandy put so much of lower Manhattan underwater. Okay. Um, so all the, all the stuff that the Bible talks about that are coming, there's, there's going to be a secular explanation for it. Just be on the watch for it. Now, we talk about days of watch. Jesus said that's one of the patterns of the end times. So here's an example uh, written by Rod Dreher in, I think, Conservative Tribune or something, heads LGBTs win, tails Christians lose. So let's set up the story. I'm going to play you the interview. Two um, lesbian females who are getting married in Canada want to have custom engagement rings made. So they go to a jeweler that's recommended. The jeweler takes their order, makes their rings, and then they recommend their friends go. So their friends go, and when their friends go, they see a sign there. Marriage is under attack. Keep, keep marriage traditional or something. You'll see the sign in a moment. He made the rings for them. They have the rings they ordered. He doesn't... He, he, he knew what... He made the rings for them. He did not bake... Didn't, he didn't refuse to bake the cake. He actually did what they wanted. Okay, now let's watch the interview from the CBC about uh, what happened. And why were you looking for rings? To get engaged. 
Uh, we went there a few months ago, and we were just speaking with them, kind of gave them some information of what we're looking for, the price range, and they work with us. They were great to work with. They seemed to have no issues. They knew the two of us were a same-sex couple. And then how did you find out about this sign? Well, I referred some of my friends to them just because I did get some good customer service and they had good prices. And he wanted a custom ring for his girlfriend as well. So I sent him in there. So him and his mom went in and they were looking around and that's when they seen the sign. Uh, they took the picture, sent it to one of my bridesmaids who sent it to me just saying, you know, is this the store that you referred him to because they are anti-gay? And I had no idea about the sign up until that point. So what did you think when you saw the sign? Um, it was really upsetting, really sad, because we already had money down on that, and they're displaying how much they are against gays and how they think that marriage should be between a man and a woman. So it was pretty upsetting. So I went back the next day and just talked to them about it, asked them, you know, what is up with the sign? And they had told me at that point that that's their beliefs. And I said, that's fine. I have no issues with them believing in what they believe in. I think everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but I don't think they should put their personal beliefs inside their business, especially when they're directing their business towards um, customers and some of them being grooms and brides who would go in there for custom work to get done. And I just said it was very disrespectful, it's very unprofessional, and I wanted a refund. Yes. Uh, will, will you send more people there no. now? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. I mean, he had the opportunity at that time to say he was sorry, to take his signs down, and then that's it. I would have been fine. But, you know, he just said that's his beliefs and it's staying up. Okay. I mean, she looks very nice, you know. She's a fascist. She's part of the gay mafia that wants to shut down any dissent on this issue. Now, people have been saying that this is coming, and now it's here, okay? I went to the Christian Legal Society meeting this week. 20, 30 lawyers, maybe 40 lawyers from big, a lot of big firms in town. And the subject was the Supreme Court's upcoming decision. I will say I was encouraged that there was a bit of an air of despair in the room. I don't think there was a single person there who thought that Justice Kennedy would vote the right way. Because he wrote the Lawrence decision. It's going to be about dignity, and I'm not too optimistic about Chief Justice Roberts either, as was nobody there. And so the question was, and I asked them, what are we going to do about it, folks? There are people in this room that are going to start losing their jobs because they're going to take a stand on this. What are we going to do? And, and really, um, nobody knew. You know, well, you know, we can point them out that they're being bigoted. Well, fine, okay. You're a bigot. I don't have a job. What are we going to do? How's the church going to react to this? It's really a time, I think, for the church is going to be given a lot of opportunity to be the church. I mean, this is, look at how offensive this. The sanctity of marriage is under attack. How? I mean, in Ireland this week, the first country to vote on a national referendum in support of gay marriage. A new beginning, historic yes for gay marriage after surge in youth vote. Coalition plans to cash in on new feel-good factor. Joy at Ireland's emphatic yes to equal marriage. Now, on their website, U2, this is from the Christian Post. Christian rock band U2 shows support for equal marriage on Instagram, building on one of the names of their most famous song, In the Name of Love, Vote Yes. On their website, um, well, somebody posted this. This is Dublin, Ireland, and rainbows. There's a big gay rainbow over Dublin. It's, that's not, if that's not Jesus giving the yes vote, I don't know what is. So there you kind of have a guy who's kind of wrapped up in one little tweet, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. 
because he, he fails to recognize what that is all about. Every time it happens, it's all about God. Your yes matters. On the, uh, this is the website of U2, Bono, the great Christian rocker, touted at Bill Hybels' Willow Creek conferences, other Christian pastors parading him around, the great man who's concerned about the poor and social justice, we need to model our lives after him. That's what they say. This is what they said on their website. Commitment, love, and devotion are some of the most impossibly great human traits. Trying to co-opt the word marriage is like trying to make love or devotion gender or religion specific. Gender. And that has to stop. Marriage is human-specific, a human commitment, one that transcends religion, transcends politics. It should be encouraged wherever, whenever, and between whomever that love, that devotion, and that commitment exists, vote yes. Bill Muhlenberg on his blog has an excellent post, Culture Watch. Fake Christians, fake marriage, he says this. One good way to spot a phony Christian is when some crucial moral or social issue comes up. When they declare their hand, that usually tells us that we need all we need to know about a person's supposed Christian credentials. For example, if you get some guy claiming to be a Christian yet fully supports something like baby killing, you can call his bluff real quick. Another clear-cut acid test of Christian commitment has to do with the issue of homosexuality. If you get someone trying to tell you that homosexual marriage is just preachy and Jesus would be fully supportive of it, then you know you've got a religious fraud on your hands and you should give him a very wide berth. This has got to be one of the most idiotic things I've read in a long time, talking about the YouTube statement on the website I just read you. We expect atheists and militant homosexual activists to come up with sheer baloney like this, but someone who calls him a Christian, this man is a fool in the biblical sense of the word. And I would add this. The men who have promoted him over the years need to apologize and repent. And if they don't, you need to stop listening to them because they are frauds. And you know exactly who I'm talking about. Questions? To go to Steve Mitchell at fbchapel.com. <laughs> you can look him up, you can find his phone number on the internet, I'm pretty sure. Well, certainly, okay, evangelicals, they're messed up. You know, there's just a, a few of them. The Pope's okay, right? The Catholic Church clearly is against this, right? By the way, you know, in Ireland, we had, that, we had the big sex scandal of Roman Catholic churches in the United States. I think all but two dioceses had lawsuits filed against them. Many of them had to file for bankruptcy to protect what little assets they had. I remember when this started back in 2001 um, or two. You, you remember the day we had Jody talk to us about um, intelligent design when we were in that, at another church? So that day I, I flew to Boston, and the, and the film crew for the BBC that had filmed part of our class that day, they were, by the way, you can still find that on, if you look around on the BBC website, you can still find the, the video of that. Um, they, were on the, they were on the plane, you know, and I, I, the guy kind of looked at me like, oh man, is this crazy guy stalking us now? Because they had interviewed me after that uh, about uh, creation, my views on creation. And um, I'm sure I, I, didn't give, I didn't follow the BBC company line, I'm 100% certain of that. But they were going to Boston for the deposition of the cardinal uh, that was in charge of the Boston Diocese. And the next morning, I walked through Post Office Square in downtown Boston, and there were every news anchor, major news anchor, sound truck, every network, it was unbelievable. It, it was a total, complete circus. I had to pick up my briefcase and carry it because there were so many cables on my suitcase and on my way to a deposition because there were so many cables on the street. Well, the scandal in Ireland was probably worse. 
involved people even higher in the hierarchy than it did in the United States. And I'm not so certain that the Irish vote doesn't have some outflow from that scandal as children were sexually abused by Roman Catholic priests. I think, there's, I, I think there is a proximate cause there. Well, the Pope has now appointed somebody to help him out named Timothy Radcliffe, a bishop who has said these things in the past. Um, this is not to denigrate committed love of people of the same sex. This is a Roman bishop now appointed by Pope Francis to head up some, something at the Vatican. This too should be cherished and supported, which is why church leaders are slowly coming to support same-sex civil unions. The God of love can be present in every true love. How does all of this bear on the question of gay sexuality? We cannot begin with the question of whether it is permitted or forbidden. We must ask what it means and how far is it, it is Eucharistic. What does that even mean? Certainly, it can be generous, vulnerable, tender, mutual, and nonviolent. So in many ways, I would think that it can be expressive of Christ's self-gift. We can see how it can be expressed of mutual fidelity, a covenantal relationship in which two people bind themselves to each other forever. Now listen, the answer to why Pope Francis allows this was in the New York Times this morning. I just happened across it. Pope's focus on poor revives theology long scorned as Marxist. It's called Liberation Theology. It came out of South and Central America where Pope Francis was trained and lived and worked. So here's how you analyze it. Pope Francis is a Catholic and a leftist Marxist. And leftism Marxism, which has no standards on sexuality, trumps his Catholicism. Very simple analysis, thank you, New York Times. I don't think they knew that they were helping us that much, but they were. Well, okay, so we have evangelicalism, we have the Roman Catholic Church, uh, our government's going this way. Certainly, uh, the Girl Scouts, right? No. They now come public that for over a year they've been uh, admitting transgender people males who claim to be female, that's what they're doing, as members of Girl Scout troops. Salon got very upset because somebody on Fox said this was just awful, the American Family Association and others said this, but it's impossible to love someone who's transgender while simultaneously stating that hormone therapy and sex reassignment surgery are each a vain, dangerous, and enormously destructive effort to obliterate their true sexual identity as fisheries with the American Family Association does. He misses the obvious, that his insistence on knowing someone else's true sexual identity is in itself a sign of hatred, at worst, deliberate ignorance at best. Of course, if this is what the group truly believes, they will always consider transgender girls nothing more than boys in skirts. And I'll admit, that's what I would consider them. Because even the head of Johns Hopkins unit, the retired head of that said, that's the reality. They're, they're born boys, we can do sex reassignment, and they're still boys. That's the physical fact. Now, I don't think that's a Christian guy, that's a psychiatrist who dealt with this issue for, for over 40 years. So, well, okay, so the Catholic evangelicals, our government, the Catholic Church, the Girl Scouts, certainly the Boy Scouts are holding the line. Here's Robert Gates, former head of the CIA. I believe he's Secretary of Defense as well. Now, for a two-year term, president of the Boy Scout Association, speaking at their meeting this week in Atlanta, said this. Finally, let me address membership policy. I told you a year ago that I would oppose reopening this issue during my two-year term as president of the BSA. I had hoped then for a respite, during which we could focus on healing our divisions from the 2013 decision, improving our program, strengthening our finances, and ending our decline in membership. However, events during the past year, 
have confronted us with urgent challenge I did not foresee last year and which we cannot ignore. We cannot ignore growing internal challenges to our current membership policy from some councils like the Greater New York Council, the Denver Area Council, and others in open defiance of the policy. To more and more councils taking a position in their mission statements and public documents contrary to national policy. Nor can we ignore the social, political, and juridical changes taking place in our country. Changes taking place at a pace over this past year that no one anticipated. Um, what he's saying is things are accelerating. Have you heard that before? I remind you of the recent debates we have seen in Indiana and Arkansas and elsewhere over discrimination based on sexual orientation, not to mention the impending U.S. Supreme Court decision on gay marriage. I'm not asking the National Board for any action to change our current policy at this meeting, but I must speak as plainly and as bluntly to you as I spoke to presidents when I was director of CIA and secretary of defense. We must deal with the world as it is, not as we might wish it would be. The status quo. Do you think he applied that philosophy when he was the head of the military of the United States? Okay. In our, members, in our movement's membership standards cannot be sustained. We can expect more councils to openly challenge the current policy. While technically we have the authority to revoke their charters, such an action would deny the lifelong benefits of scouting to hundreds of thousands of boys and young men today and vastly more in the future. I will not take that path. Moreover, dozens of states, from New York to Utah, are passing laws that protect employment rights on the basis of sexual orientation. Thus, between internal challenges and potential legal conflicts, the BSA finds itself in an unsustainable position a position that makes us vulnerable to the possibility the courts will simply order us at some point to change our membership policy. We must all understand that this probably will happen sooner rather than later. In 2010, a single federal district judge in California overturned the military's don't ask, don't tell law. And the reversal was applied nationwide immediately. Only a stay granted by the appeals court granted, I believe, mainly because we were in the process of changing the law, prevented dramatic disruption of the armed forces. We cannot predict if or when this might happen to us, but I personally believe our legal defenses have weakened since the Dale case. And if we wait for the courts to act, we could end up with a broad ruling that could forbid any kind of membership standard, including our foundational belief in our duty to God and our focus on serving the specific needs of boys. Waiting for the courts is a gamble with huge stakes. Alternatively, we can move at some future date, but sooner rather than later, to seize control of our own future, to set our own course and, chart and change our policy in order to allow charter partners, unit sponsoring organizations, to determine the standards for their scout leaders. Such an approach would allow all churches, which sponsor some 70% of our scout units, to establish leadership standards consistent with their faith. We must, at all costs, preserve the religious freedom of our church partners to do this. When they start attacking the churches, do you think that guy's going to be any use to you? I, here's one solution. Put men in charge of the Boy Scouts, not wimps like this. Sorry. Um, very troubling. Um, it's over. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, we're probably past the tipping point, folks. Let's be honest, okay? And God will deal with this the way that he sees fit to deal with this. So how long that is, I don't know. It's not going to not happen. Um, 
it's coming. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Uh, and we, boy, we can't take the risk of what a court would do. We'll stand up to them. Where's Congress? Where's everybody in Congress? Let's, you know, I heard a survey this week of historical figures. And in the ranking, Karl Marx finished way ahead of Winston Churchill. Are you kidding me? It's worse than you think. <laughs> I hear things like that. Well, let's look at the Middle East, because we know that that's where um, the main focus of the geopolitical turmoil in the end times will come. This is an interesting uh, map. This was the control of ISIS back in a year ago. You see the gray area here. Um, they really exercised pretty effective control over that whole area. Um, a year later, of course, now we have our policy in place, which the White House said this week is going quite well. And so now they have twice as much territory, including now they've taken over Palmyra. I'll tell you about that in a minute. They control half of Syria. That's a, that yellow area there. Those are um, Mediterranean area and uh, Middle East area countries with active ISIS cells. In their magazine, ISIS says that Islam is the religion of the sword, not pacifism. So this week, frantic messages came out of Palmyra. It fell. We're finished. Um, they, um, things, bad things happen. Even Saudi Arabia says that there's alarm as half of Syria is under IS control. Another Arab newspaper, U.S. strategy in question, after Daesh, that's an Arab word for Islamic State, advance. They've taken over Palmyra, which is probably one of the um, leading uh, cultural sites uh, in terms of like Roman ruins and the uh, Islamic State people were seen entering a museum in Pal Palmyra this morning. We think that these uh, things will be destroyed. They also took over Ramadi, which was the capital of Ambar prom province, and they're now um, 80 miles from Baghdad. And uh, the Ar Iraqis are blaming us, we're blaming them, nobody's taking responsibility, and yet they continue to grow. Ralph Duthot in the um, New York Times this morning has an interesting editorial. And let me just read a little bit of what he says in that. Because I think it's, it's a good analysis. Um, the fall of an autocrat leads to foreign occupation and civil war. A revolutionary movement with a messianic vision capitalizes on chaos to gain power. The revolutionaries rule through terror and the promise of utopia and inspire copycats around the world. But other nations impose a quarantine, internal rivals regain ground, and despite initial successes, the new regime seems quite unlikely to survive, especially once outside powers, including the United States, join the force against it. This is the story to date of the Islamic State, which defied predictions to its imminent collapse by capturing Ramadi in Iraq and Palmyra in Syria last week. A tactical setback, President Obama called these developments, and quite possibly they are, it's still hard to imagine that the self-styled caliphate can long endure. But this is also the story of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union's early days, when it seemed highly implausible that a cabal of Bolsheviks would rule the Russian Empire for 70-odd years. When the Bolshevik regime was about that age that the Islamic, Islamic State is today, the United States, France, and Britain were supporting its white Russian adversaries and landing troops in Russia, Japan, and a reborn Poland were pressuring the Bolsheviks from east and west, and the fear instilled by the Red Terror seemed like the primary force keeping the pariah state from crumbling. A generation later, that pariah was a global superpower. But the Soviet example is still a useful reminder that the inevitable fall of fanatical, fanatical upstarts is not always actually inevitable, and it offers a few lessons in how, against all odds, the Islamic State might actually survive. I 
have friends who um, are Bible prophecy teachers, and they think that uh, the total discretion of Islam is at hand. I am not that optimistic. I, I know it comes when Jesus comes, okay? It will be dealt with completely, but I don't know that it happens completely before then. I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, Obama uh, went to a synagogue. I, I hear he was only the third president ever to speak in a synagogue before, the largest one in, in Washington, D.C. And he talked about his support for Israel. No, seriously. You need to listen to him. Um, so let's just listen to what he had to say at the synagogue in Washington. Tomorrow night, the holiday of Shavuot, marks the moment that Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. The first link in a chain of tradition that stretches back oh, I meant to take that thousands out. of years. From Einstein to Brandeis, from Jonas Salk to Betty Friedan, American Jews have made contributions to this country that have shaped it in every aspect. And as a community, American Jews have helped make our union more perfect. The story of Exodus inspired oppressed people around the world in their own struggles for civil rights. From the founding members of the NAACP to a Freedom Summer in Mississippi, from women's rights to gay rights, to workers' rights. Jews took the heart of the biblical edict that we must not oppress a stranger, having been strangers once ourselves. So the heritage that we celebrate this month is a testament to the power of hope. Me standing here before you, all of you in this incredible congregation, is a testament to the power of hope. It's a rebuke to cynicism. It's a rebuke to nihilism. And it inspires us to have faith that our future, like our past, will be shaped by the values that we share. Around the world, those values compel us to redouble our efforts to protect our planet and to protect the human rights of all who share this planet. It's particularly important to remember now, given the tumult that is taking place in so many corners of the globe, in one of the world's most dangerous neighborhoods, those shared values compel us to uh, reaffirm that our enduring friendship with the people of Israel and our unbreakable bonds with the state of Israel that those bonds, that friendship, cannot be broken. Those values compel us to say that our commitment to Israel's security and my commitment to Israel's security is and always will be unshakable. And I've said this before, it would be a moral failing on the part of the U.S. government and the American people. It would be a moral failing on my part if we did not stand up firmly, steadfastly, not just on behalf of Israel's right to exist, but its right to thrive and prosper. Because it would ignore, it would ignore the history that brought the state of Israel about. It would ignore the struggle that's taken place through millennia to try to affirm the kinds of values that say everybody has a place. Everybody has rights. Everybody is a child of God. When someone threatens Israel's citizens or its very right to exist, Israelis necessarily take that seriously. And so do I. Today, the military and intelligence cooperation between our two countries is stronger than ever. Our support of the Iron Dome's rocket system has saved 
Israeli lives. And I can say that no U.S. president, no administration has done more to ensure that Israel can protect itself than this one. As part of that commitment, there's something else that the United States and Israel agrees on. Iran must not, under any circumstances, be allowed to get a nuclear weapon. Okay, well, he went on. You can uh, reach your own conclusion. I'll close with this just a few minutes. Uh, in to, uh, in a, the recent issue of uh, Forward Magazine, a Jewish publication, Tuvia Tenenbaum, uh, well, this was in January. Uh, I just found it today. Uh, why European NGOs and the Red Cross are real enemies in Israel. Uh, now, uh, this man, he recounts his, uh, he started out in the ultra-Orthodox, we're the perfect Torah-only Jews, we don't even support the state of Israel. He moved to orthodoxy, to leftism, and he's kind of come back full circle. And so he, went, he left Israel for, I think, 33 years, and he's come back, and now he's talking about what he's observed in Israel. And this is very fascinating because I think it brings into focus a lot of the problem of uh, where uh, evangelicals like Lynn Hybels and others and the Friends of Sabeel uh, conferences and the emergent churches on the issue of Israel and the Palestinians. So just listen to him. He, he sounds very much like uh, Caroline Glick, but uh, just listen to what he has to say. And he talks about he, he, he went to Israel and he, he met some Palestinian young ladies. Here's an example. I was sitting next to a couple of young German girls at an anti-Israel event held at Al-Quds University in Jerusalem, in which we were told that the state of Israel was created by massacring bands of Jews who came over to this part of the world for no obvious reason and slaughtered thousands of sleeping civilians in the middle of the night. The girls applauded. Today's leftists have also gone through huge changes. Some run NGOs that are supported by millions upon millions of dollars from foreign donors and spend their days and nights in pursuit of one dream, totally destroy this country's Jewish identity. It is mind-boggling to me how people who dedicate their lives to preserving Palestinian identity and culture don't even think of studying this culture. I studied Arabic, the Quran, the Hadith, and whatever else I could get my hands on, and yet I don't go around proclaiming my love. The elite Israeli leftists that I meet, they know Kant, Nietzsche, Sarte, Aristotle, but they don't know the Quran or Hadith, not even Arabic. Aside from the Jews, there are Arabs here as well, of course. Have they changed? Talking about what he noticed in a 33-year absence. Oh, yes, they have. The smiles I used to see on their faces 33 years ago have by now totally disappeared. Before Europe and America poured countless amounts of money into various peace initiatives here, Arabs and Jews mixed pretty well. He talked about how then he went up into the uh, Palestinian territory, Area A, where the, the Palestinians will, will get. And look at what he says. And I'm going to ask you, have you ever heard this from the mainstream media about what goes on in Area A? They know me here as Toby the German, a name I go by whenever I'm with Palestinians. And they love me, this Aryan man. Had I been Tuvia, a name that would immediately identify me as Jewish, there's a strong likelihood that I wouldn't be among the living today. Nowhere in Palestine, or Area A in Oslo terms, can you find a single Jew, unless he has been hijacked and most likely killed. That this master of Palestinian, and he talked to one of the Palestinian secret police, and he goes, did this master of Palestinian espionage find out that I'm no Toby? He's nervous. By the grace and mercy of Allah, he says he didn't. Your name from now on is Abu Ali, he said to me. Abu Ali, which indicates a respect and courage in Palestinian Arabic, is also the name that some Palestinians call Adolf Hitler. Do you ever hear this? You hear this from Barack Obama? Do you hear this from Lynn Hybels and the Christian Palestinianists that promote this nonsense? 
or from the Pope who goes and does a mass in front of a, a picture of Jesus in, a, in the Muslim headgear, the Palestinian headgear? How did this change in the Arab-Jewish relationship take place? It took me months of roaming the streets to reveal the presence of people who have worked hard to bring this change into being. Who are these people? Sadly, they are the NGO activists who roam this land spreading hatred. They are not the only ones, for there is another culprit, the U European Union. To be fair, they are not the only guilty parties around here. The U.S. Agency for International Development, contrary to many people's belief, is not made up of righteous people either. But USAID is a small player compared to the Europeans, so let's stick with the Europeans for now. Surprise? I was. But reality is the best killer of surprises, and the reality here is amazingly poisonous. The people I've encountered from the Red Cross here do more important things than just attending the sick or taking care of people in need. For example, spending resources recruiting or, and or supplying Arabs with just the right tools to catch and record the bad Jews roaming this piece of earth. Israel is an occupier, they teach the Arabs, and the Arabs must fight the occupying Jews. When was this land occupied? No, no, don't say 1967, this land was occupied in 1948. While we were driving, the Red Cross rep talked to me. When they, Israel, demolish houses, we come together with the PRC, the Palestinian Red Crescent, and offer hygiene kits and tents to the people who have just lost their homes. All the buildings in Sheikh Jarrah have vacate orders, and Israel will put settlers there. This sounds really bad. How many homes have been demolished in Sheikh Jarrah so far, I ask him? He tried to add them all up in his mind and came up with the exact sum. Zero. So the whole thing is based on lies. It's, they come from the father of lies. These things come from Satan himself. And we know that this is what the scripture says. All nations will be gathered against Jerusalem. They'll hate the Jews. There'll be conspiracy theories, all this stuff. And we see it happening right in front of us. It's converging with all the other signs, what's going on in culture, and then the apostasy in the church. And I could go on and on and on about all the different things that are piling up uh, here. And so we need to get ready. You know, it's time you need to take steps to prepare. And hopefully we'll, I think everybody needs to follow their own conscience in that right now. But it's, I think it's really time that we, we get serious about what we're doing. So, Jesus is coming back, and uh, he's going to take care of all this. There's nothing to worry about if you're a, a true believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, get ready. Let's pray. Father, as we say every week, thank you so much for your word and letting us know what was going on in advance, or what would be going on in advance of what is to most of us when we're operating just in our, our fleshly realm, a very troubling time. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Keep us in your word. And keep us full of hope of the soon return of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.